Jens, thank you very much for joining me. Tell me a little bit about the museum, first of all. Um, I'll uh, introduce the museum. The museum has been in its present location um, for just coming up to about 13 years. Um, one of the things that uh, we sort of emphasise on at the moment is World War II. Um, and a very important part of the museum work is the restoration work that we've done. Um, and up until now, it's primarily focused on World War II types. Um, and we're quite lucky being located near Gatwick Airport that we get some, you know, aircraft um, engineers volunteer and make their time available to us. We got a, quite a good equipped workshop as well, which, um, you know, sort of uh, really does help as well. Um, but we are all volunteers here at the museum. Um, and we sort of call ourselves a, a remembrance museum because the museum is about the people and the personal stories, not just the airframes, the parts and the equipment, but um, yeah, very much the kind of the emphasis is on the people. And I think, I think our visitors like that. There's so much here to see that, that there's the big exhibits, small exhibits, there's literally hundreds of personal stories here at the museum. And tell me a little bit about those exhibits that you do have. Uh, obviously focused on uh, World War II, B-25 and other bits and pieces? Yes, we. one of our sort of centrepiece displays um, at the moment is a C-47 fuselage, um, a Dakota or a Skytrain as the Americans called it. And that was actually used in the filming of Band of Brothers when it was with a film company. Um, so visitors can actually walk inside that um, and uh, it's probably one of the few airframes that is accessible for wheelchairs as well, which is really nice. That goes very well with our school visits as well. Um, we actually do a, a school's workshop, which is called the D-Day Experience, and we get them all to take up the positions of the paratroopers, get them to kind of contemplate how they might be feeling, you know, flying over to France and going into combat for the first time. And then um, at the end, we get them to demonstrate the kind of um, the, the sort of hook up scenario where they kind of hook up and do an equipment check and then they all go running out of it yelling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, th they love it. And I think yeah. that's what we find is that actually as the new generation um, emerges and it's going to be down to them to kind of carry the message of remembrance forward into kind of subsequent sort of decades. But we find the museum and what's in the museum is what kind of connects to them. Whereas if you had just a, a history book and plonked that in front of them, um, they would be fairly disinterested. But I think when they're able to explore a museum such as ours, they see things that kind of get their interest and it kind of leads them in. But we've also got some, um, we got a cockpit from a Douglas A26 Invader um, and that actually served in World War II. Uh, we made contact with the pilot that flew it during uh, 1944. He flew 13 uh, missions in it. We believe um, it went on to Korea but we are certain that it then went on to Vietnam. So it's wow. um, quite remarkable that it's been through all that and survived. But like many of these things, um, they spend a lot of time where they're kind of uncared for, abandoned. Um, and if they're in our kind of elements, you know, such as they are now, if I look out the, the door of the museum right now, it's pretty horrible out there. Mm. So, you know, we are, always with world war ii types in particular battling corrosion so a lot of our restoration work is focused around cutting that out and replacing it um we like to use solid rivets and try and do things as near as we can um but bearing in mind these airframes were kind of mass produced um using massive sort of um rubber presses and of course we don't have that now so we're kind of replicating it on a one-off basis mm. um we've got uh trying to think what oh we've had a recent edition this year which is kind of 
gone missed a little bit because of the COVID-19 thing. Um, it arrived just before lockdown, but that was a Beaufort, a Bristol Beaufort cockpit oh, wow. that's here at the museum. Um, we have a Bowfighter cockpit, Bristol Bowfighter, a Mark 1F. Um, that's in our Red Hill section. Fantastic. P-63 King Cobras. Well, uh, you, we have... You're wetting my appetite very nicely. And I should have started with an apology about not having visited the museum before. I mentioned earlier, before we started recording the call, that uh, you know I've spent a lot of time, about 20 minutes away from you and never come across you. And both of those types, I need to come and see. The Beaufort, the Bowfighter. My daughter's called Bow. And uh, oh, this right. is my route to get her interested in aircraft. Is telling Let's hope she's not a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she is. She's got an older brother and she can hold her own, let me tell you. Um, yeah, so we'll have to come and have a look at those. And well, it's interesting. Do. Yeah. And it's interesting you're talking about the, the, you know, the aircraft, the state that aircraft end up in and the, the work that you do to restore them. That probably brings us on nicely to the Harrier and the state that, that you found that on that in. And tell us a little bit about that airframe and how you found it. You want me to just... Yeah, introduce? yeah, please do. I'll, I'll introduce the kind of background um, and I'll hand over to Aaron, who is a little bit more kind of um, up with the technicalities of it. But we have future plans here at the museum. Um, and basically, uh, they are sort of fairly long term. It's quite a big project, but it would see more display space for the museum because we are getting quite tight now on exhibition space and also workshop space. So we have future plans uh, to expand the museum and it will take us into the post-war era. Um, and the reason that our Kestrel is so important to us is that um, we plan to, to move the museum in the long term to Dunsfold Aerodrome, ah, um, wow. where where the museum has acquired some land and has recently been granted an outline planning permission to establish a museum there. But of course, we only get one chance at this. It's it's a massive project. It will take some time. So we're kind of we are thinking ahead here, um, but. I was actually in Belgium um, with the other trustees at the time and I, we, we'd gone out for a meal and I was sitting there kind of um, being really Mr. Antisocial as I am and scrolling through <laughs> my phone <laughs> and on the, one of the Facebook pages this Kestrel sort of come up and it was photographed um, sort of with its wings on at that time. I think the photographs was when it was at the paintball site. and. I kind of, well, we all recognise that, you know, there aren't many Kestrels around. Um, it's a very iconic aircraft for um, Dunsfold. And really, um, there isn't going to be any more opportunities to acquire such an airframe. But so within about half an hour, we'd actually negotiated the price and we'd actually acquired it. Um, but it took took quite a bit more time to actually get it imported into into England for it to return home I'm sure. um, although there were a few people in America that um, claimed that it was uh, designed in America, built in America and it should stay in America so um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cl clearly they hadn't discovered Google but uh, <laughs> but it, I think it was quite a privilege to return it back to the UK um, and I suppose that leads on nicely to what it was doing out in America which I'll hand over to Aaron Simmons, who's the kind of project leader on this project. Yeah, hello. Um, the the aircraft um, was one of nine Kestrels built just after the six P1127s. And there's there's a lot of people that think the P1127 and the Kestrel are the same aircraft, and they're not. There's there's a major amount of differences. It's too long to go into. But, um, it's basically a complete redesign, and then. Obviously, when the Harrier came along, that was once again a complete redesign. Um, the aircraft first flew on 10th of December 1964 um, from Dunsfold. It was built at um, Kingston and then just uh, transported to Dunsfold for final assembly and first flew. It was the first aircraft that was delivered to the Triparte um, Evaluation Squadron. And then it actually went back to Dunsfold for some modification work. I think it was engine modification work before being re-delivered. 
Um, after the evaluations were done, um, the aircraft were, were split up. Some went to the States, some stayed in the UK. West Germany didn't have any. Um, so the aircraft went to the States, I think it was January 1966, and then it became 64-18268. That was its uh, new serial number. Um, it was there for a little while, and then NASA acquired it. And, it and this, is, this is the, the coolest aspect of this aeroplane to me. You know, you, you talk is. about cool <laughs> aviation things. You combine NASA with Harrier and you suddenly hit, hit the gold mine as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. And unfortunately, it was doing some testing and it had a ground loop incident. It was 27th of August 1967. And the pilot flying it was a Lee H. Pearson Jr., who later become chief test pilot of NASA and was involved in the Apollo missions. So it's Somebody it's got there. quite a, a vast history. And um, it was obviously written off because the, I think it's the starboard outrigger dug into the ground and um, flung around, um, did quite a bit of damage there, did some damage to the nose. The canopy emergence to release didn't actually work so they had to break the canopy to get the um to get lee h pearson out um not much damage other than that if the aircraft had stayed with that amount of damage it would have been a lot nicer <laughs> but unfortunately it went between a few owners um i think it went to tom riley's um flying tigers museum am i correct there yeah um in that was in florida wasn't it yep yeah in florida um, it was there for a little while, um, obviously dismantled, never really put on display. Um, then I think it went to another private owner before going to a paintball field mm -hmm. where most of its damage has occurred. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the nose was completely trashed um, so much that we're actually having to roll new skins for it, which is a, a real shame. Um, the undercarriage has gone missing which is a real shame. We're trying to get a set. We know somewhere where there are three sets of undercarriage, but they're playing hardball at the moment. <laughs> Shall I name it? <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, the RF Museum. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, just in their store, they've got, I think, three nose gear, two main gear for Kestrels. But... I mean, yeah, they've got and there are no car. other Kestrels that need them other than ours. So. Oh, that's what exactly. I was going to say, yeah, they've got the wonderful aircraft up there, which we saw outside a few years ago. I've included a bit of video of the aircraft on static display at Cosford. Um, yeah, come on, RAF Museum. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you a good mention. Our <laughs> <laughs> um, aircraft hasn't actually got its original wing either. Um the 694's wing is actually on the Kestrel that's hanging up in Langley. So um, for some reason, they did a wing swap. Mm. Um, but someone, a previous owner, has actually managed to make our job even harder by cutting the wing in half, mm. which is not very nice. Um, we have got plans to repair it, and we're lucky enough to have a, um ex-Harrier um structural engineer who's helping us wow so he still works for bae so what's really good um what was i gonna say uh, we have recently acquired a p1127 wing from uh brooklyn's museum we uh thank them for that <laughs> so that's gonna make our life a lot easier because we can actually fit that to our aircraft whilst we repair our wing and it will actually make repairing our wing a lot easier because we can um we can jig it and yeah. um, do the repairs and then all the flaps and um, ailerons are exactly the same. So we can flop, we can actually swap everything over. Um, what else? I suppose um, really the, the aircraft doesn't have its main gear at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's not to say that uh, Harrier ones couldn't be adapted, but they're not quite the same. But it's not uncommon for these uh, Kestrels and 1127s to have Harrier parts fitted to them. There's a lot of aircraft in national museums that have got Harrier bits hiding there. Um, 
So really what, what we're in need of is a tail fin um, and a Harrier one would fit. It might need a little bit of modification, um, some horizontal tail plane. Um, the wing section we're actually okay with. The undercarriage, we're hopeful um, that we can actually acquire the ones that are kind of in storage with the RAF Museum because we know that ultimately they're really nice people and I'm sure <laughs> they'd love to support a project like this. Um, so uh, Engine doors as well. Yeah, and an engine door we could do with. We, we're quite... Um, uh, we've got the cockpit panels now. We the, the lower panels were fortunately still in the aircraft um, so we've actually had the upper instrument panels laser cut and we're just populating those now. But the cockpit was removed from the main fuselage because it is a production break. And in its landing mishap, it had actually suffered a fracture on one of the intakes. So it was partially removed anyway. So it needed to come off to carry out that repair. But it also enabled the cockpit to go to Aaron Simmons' um, workshop in his back garden, mm -hmm. where um, over the lockdown he was able to sort of um, press ahead with getting it ready so that the new skins can be formed. Um, and, you know, it, it's kind of at its worst at the moment because everything's been removed from it. Yeah. Um, we're actually having to get a specialist uh Aaron I know more but basically a specialist who will roll the skins on an English wheel we have the English wheel here at the museum but what we don't have is the people who know how to use it um so he will actually in due course be coming here to the museum um and we are paying um for his services because obviously um talent like that comes at a cost mm. um and you know that brings us nicely onto the subject of kind of money. Mm -hmm. um, we we are uh, looking to raise funds for this project um, because we have quite a few projects on the go here at the museum, and you know um, the more kind of funding we can get on board, the more things like um, getting this chapter roller skins we can do, which will save an awful lot of time and he's actually he used to work on Harriers forming skin. So, you know, they, they, he will do a really nice job uh, and it will transform that cockpit. But those kind of compound curves, we couldn't do here ourselves. We kind of had to hold our hands up on that one and kind of, and this is where the funding comes in is that there are things that we can do and there are things that we kind of, we probably could, but how long would it take? Um, and how much expense in waste material. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the scrap oh, yeah. bin might end up quite full. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's quite so, a shopping list of, of parts you've got there. But as you say, the, the way these things go, isn't it? It's sort of people being supportive of each other and uh, yeah. sort of yeah. helping and focusing on things. But the funding then is, an, is, of, is clearly going to make the difference for this airframe, isn't it? That, and I know you've set up a GoFundMe specifically for the Kestrel. Um, yep. I'll include a link, of course, in the description below. But that money's going towards that airframe, is it? And particularly for the for that that work with the English wheel and the rolling the yeah. skin. Yeah. If if um, I mean, any money that we do uh, get donated for that project, we ensure that that's where it goes. Um, but I suppose we've kind of been through this lockdown, and um, sort of asking for money. I mean, everybody's asking for money right now, so. I don't think, I think the sort of COVID thing hasn't really helped the project. Um, but, uh, and it, it needs more promotion. I mean, people can help us as well by just looking up our page on Facebook, yeah. sharing it, sharing it to groups, just getting the word out there. Um, I believe you heard about us through something sort of similar. So it's that snowball effect, yeah. you know, that once the snowball starts rolling down the hill, you know, things sort of start to happen. And like with Brooklyn's support, um, I mean, that was a massive coup, really. I mean, I would say that that's probably the only wing section probably in the world that, you know, that would fit our aircraft. And um, we're really grateful to them for that. Um, mm. We actually removed that from the museum about five or six weeks ago. Mm. Um, so... Yeah, and it, it's in really good condition. I mean, mm -hmm. they've really looked after it. So that itself doesn't actually need any work at all. 
it's ready to fit. So it'll take the pressure off on the original wings. Um, and they're, they're not too bad to repair, but the hardest thing is going to be that's going to need a jig to make sure that they go back together properly. Yes. Um, they're, they're easy enough to join back together, but it's getting it, to, you know, getting it joined back together how it should be so it fits the airframe. So yes. it'll enable us to kind of take our time on that one. And um, so, yeah, we've yeah. we got, got a lot of work, but, you know, um, I suppose we, we're kind of used to that. If you're into um, historic aircraft, you know, um, then this is kind of part and parcel of what you do. And we, for some reason, we tend to pick very rare aircraft, mm. which makes yeah. life even harder. Well, the, I mean, had the, it been a hunter or something like that, I think it would be a lot easier. But Yeah, well, another nice uh, Hawker type. Yeah, and it's interesting you talking about, I hadn't realised that plan with Dunsfold. So very mm. many of members of our audience will remember the air shows that we've spent a lot of time filming over the years. And that to the idea of taking a Kestrel and museum back to Dunsfold, a, a, a site that's, uh, I'm not, I haven't kept my ear to the ground too well on Dunsfold, but I don't think it's an airfield for much longer if it is still. Um, and the idea that there could be a bit of a bit of the history of Hawker left there would uh, would be superb, wouldn't it? And uh, it sounds like you're making yeah. steps in that direction. And we've actually started with the the hardest two aircraft to get for Dunsfold, not only the Kestrel. Um, you mentioned it earlier. We've got the B twenty five. Ah, yeah, the, the B twenty five Mitchell. Um, we have uh, the whole airframe there, so um, we're kind of focusing on the wings and the cockpit at the moment. So that's another project that we're doing here <laughs> at the museum. So we are a bit of a glutton for punishment, really. But, <laughs> but we find visitors um, love seeing projects. They will come back in like six or eight months time just to see how it's going and i think it sort of keeps the museum alive rather than just being a static um group of exhibits that never changes you know we're always striving to improve what we have to add to what we have so there's always something different here you know um in fact today we are moving things around again as we always seem to be doing that to, to kind of shift things around to get more things in the workshop um so yeah it's uh, I, I think it's although it has its challenges um you know i think it's an important part of the museum work you know these these airframes are some of some of them are kind of its last chance saloon you know um and they're historically important that they need to be rescued and saved mm. and most importantly they need to be on public display absolutely and tell me where people can can fo follow you follow that work and uh, hopefully in due course come for a visit and i'm assuming not we're, we're not sending people to aaron's workshop his back garden are we <laughs> <laughs> no um the the kestrel cop is actually going to come back to the museum hopefully in the next two weeks um we've got a engine rollover stand and We've got one of our volunteers in today and he's actually extending it for us. So sorry if you can hear a grinder in the background. <laughs> um, so the, the cockpit's going to go into that um, to make our life easier. So we can completely roll it over um, to do the skin work. And uh, there's quite a bit of uh, internal work on the underside as well, um, which is, the access isn't very good. As uh, any former Harrier engineer would know, the Harry is a bit of a, a nightmare to work on <laughs> for any British aircraft. <laughs> and um, you can follow the projects. We've got we've got a Wings Museum Facebook page, but we've also got individual Facebook pages for the projects. So the, the B25's got one, the Kestrel's got one, the A26 has got one, but that's slowed down now because uh, it's pretty much complete. The P63's got one. Um, we're on Instagram. We're on Twitter, all the social media. So just so, look out for uh, Wings Museum. Well. Just Wings Museum on most of those platforms, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, gents, for, for making the time. And as I say, I will include that link to the GoFundMe, but it sounds like you're well spread across social media so people can follow the, the projects of their choosing. Yep. And uh, like me, one day come for a visit. Thanks again. Please Thank do. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.